All right, so thank you everybody and welcome to our webinar on the upcoming externally led patient focused drug development meeting on hypophosphatasia. Next slide. Um, so for those of you who don't know what an LPFDD is, you're gonna find out from today's webinar and it's a really important time for you to make your voice heard. It's our one-time opportunity to share our living with HPP. Um, as well as with these important decision makers. And it doesn't matter where you live, you can live anywhere in the world. Geographically, it doesn't matter or where you are in your journey, whether you're recently diagnosed or maybe you were diagnosed as a, as a child. Um, what really matters is your story and your personal journey with HPP. And we have two goals with this LPFDD. The primary goal is to hear directly from you um, from patients and from caregivers about perspectives of living with HPP, as well as experiences with symptoms and treatment and the impact on your daily life. And the second goal is to improve the development of new drugs that are coming through the research pipeline and to really help improve the regulatory landscape of how these drugs are considered as they're approved for hypophosphatasia. Next slide. We're grateful to our sponsors who are, are making this happen. Um, one of them, uh, Alexia and AstraZeneca Rare Disease is our premium platinum sponsor. Uh, Purec is a platinum sponsor. And then our gold sponsors, Aruvant and Rally Bio. A few housekeeping notes. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, as you heard, prompted at the beginning of the webinar. It will last approximately one hour. We ask all of you to mute your microphones uh, so that we can optimize the speaker's audio. The webinar is being recorded, obviously, and will be available for later viewing on our website. And we'll also put it on our Facebook page, uh, as well as our YouTube channel. And if you have any questions during the course of the webinar, please use the chat box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll answer them at the end of the webinar. So what's the purpose of this meeting? What is it? externally led patient focused drug development meeting. The purpose of the meeting is to educate the FDA and other key stakeholders about what it's like to live with HPP, how HPP impacts your life, how you're currently managing your disease, and what a meaningful treatment would look like to you. And obviously your participation is really important to make this a success because having your voice heard is really the best way to learn about the disease. We all know that, we say that all the time. This is our chance to do this, to hear directly from patients and have that message go directly to the FDA and other people, researchers, clinicians, anyone else, even family members who are interested in learning about HPP. So the FDA approves treatments and needs to know what is important to you as patients as they're considering new, tre new treatments coming through the pipeline. And the knowledge that they, that they receive through these testimonies and through these stories does impact their decision-making process and can potentially lead to faster approvals for treatments. So why now? Um, traditionally, the patient voice has been historically absent from the regulatory process, and they really didn't look to hear from patients unless there was a problem, whether it was uh, an approval and maybe there was an issue that wasn't treated that, that patients were complaining about, or potentially a, a clinical trial that maybe wasn't meeting its endpoints and that the drug company or the FDA wanted to hear from patients to understand what the problem was. But now that that tide is shifting a bit and the FDA wants to hear more about these diseases and understand them at the beginning of the process. So what happened a couple of years ago was the FDA started hosting their own patient-focused drug development meetings when they had a treatment coming through for a particular rare disease. And what they realized was this was so helpful, hearing directly from the patients and hearing their stories and helping them to understand the landscape of these different diseases to help them to consider these drugs that they realized that they needed to host more of them, but they didn't have the capacity to manage all the logistics to be able to host all these meetings for all these different rare diseases. So what they did was they basically decentralized it and said, hey, patient advocacy groups, we love these 
patient-focused drug development meetings, but we don't have the capacity to host on them ourselves. So we look to you to host them. So we are, as Softbones, are hosting it, and that's why it's called an externally led PFDD. So we're looking to tell our stories, again, from the patients and caregivers to help to educate them on, on what HPP is all about. So what is it? How can you participate? How can I learn more? Uh, I'm joined by James Valentine and Larry Bauer from Hyman Phelps and McNamara, who uh, Denise and I have gotten to know very well over the past several months, and they're helping us to plan this meeting. So they're going to answer all of your questions. Uh, James has worked the past 13 years as a champion for the patient voice as part of the regulatory process. He previously worked at the FDA, where he was a patient liaison, helping to incorporate the patient voice into medical product review across the FDA's various medical product centers and review divisions. There, he helped to develop and launch the patient-focused drug development initiative. So he's a great person to be leading us through these efforts. And then Larry Bauer worked at the NIH for 17 years in clinical research followed by a position at the FDA as a regulatory scientist in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research's Rare Diseases Program, a group that he co-founded and worked for 10 years where he advanced rare disease drug development. In private practice, James and Larry have worked with many patient advocacy organizations like Softbones to ensure the community's voices were heard by decision makers. Relevant to our LPFDD meeting, they've been involved in helping plan and moderate three quarters of the over 50 externally led PFDD meetings. So we're in excellent hands with James and Larry, and I'm gonna turn it over to them to uh, take us through some slides and then answer any of your questions. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, this is James Valentine, and you'll be hearing from my colleague, Larry Bauer shortly. Uh, Deborah, that's a fantastic overview of what this externally led patient-focused drug development meeting you know, is uh, all about at a high level. And so the rest of this webinar is really designed to give all of you in this community the information that you need, um, you know, to, you know, if you are interested in this, participating in this meeting, kind of be able to uh, participate effectively and maximize your, your involvement. Um, but also if, if you're attending this uh, webinar or watching it on demand and you're unsure if this is a meeting you should participate in, our hope is that by the end of, of the webinar, you'll see why that participation is so important, and we, we hope that you'll contribute. So in our uh, uh, kind of the information we want to cover today, um, we have a, a few things that we think are really valuable to kind of help orient you and, and bring you up to speed. So that way, you know, uh, when you are participating in this meeting, you'll be able to, again, be as uh, effective of an advocate by sharing your personal experiences and preferences. Um, we're going to first talk about a little bit of background on FDA and drug development and the role that FDA plays in that. It's always good to know your, your audience when we're, um, you know, having these types of meetings. And so uh, we want you to know about, um, you know, that the role that FDA plays. Um, once we've discussed that a bit, we'll then talk about the role that your, your voices as patient and caregivers uh, play in that process and specifically how patient-focused drug development brings your voices into that process. Um, we'll continue to kind of uh, dive deeper and then give you an overview of how this uh, externally led meeting is really organized and uh, ultimately, you know, give you, provide you a little bit of a guide to participating. Everything from the meeting logistics format and, and some tips from Larry and my experience in helping facilitate these meetings. So I'm gonna cover that first topic and give you some background on FDA and drug development um, really hoping to, to, you know, this may be a little bit of a refresher for some of you, but we want everyone in this community to, you know, have the same kind of uh, foundational understanding of this process and, and, again, where FDA fits into it. So when we're talking about drug development, um, we're really actually talking about a process that starts well before we have an individual drug or, or other um, uh, medical product. You know, we're talking about the research that happens, and a lot of the times this is basic science research, the type of research that the National Institutes of Health and academic research centers all across the, the country and world are doing to better understand the disease and the disease process. 
And the reason that we do that is so that way we can understand where there might be opportunities uh, to intervene and either stop or maybe even reverse the effects of a disease. Once we have that basic science understanding, then that gives us an opportunity at some of those points where we think we can impact the disease course to start testing different compounds or maybe even developing novel technologies um, that may be able to, to, again, intervene to try to help stop or reverse some of the effects. Um, sometimes these uh, the effects we're trying to, to treat are just the uh, symptoms of the disease, not the underlying condition itself. You know, other times we're you know, able to identify drugs that may be disease modifying and can actually kind of treat the root cause of the condition. Um, you know, regardless of whether, again, this is, is you know, uh, maybe an existing drug, maybe it's even approved for a different disease and we're repurposing it um, due to some other unanticipated effects it has, or it's something that's, you know, really targeted and can, and can you know, directly address, you know, our disease's specific um, etiology, uh, once we identify those promising compounds, then we take them into the research phases. And the first research phase is one that is before we ever take a, a product and test it in people, um, and that's called the preclinical development phase. So in preclinical development, it's exactly what preclinical stands for, is pre going into the clinic or pre-human testing. Um, we're testing uh, the drug to make sure that it's reasonably safe before we ever use it in humans, and that we have a you know uh, enough information to the, you know uh, to conclude that it's going to you know have a sufficient chance of being effective at actually treating the disease, um, either by understanding um, you know how it works in chemical assay tests, or even if we have um, and when when we have them, animal models of a particular disease. Um, so those safety tests are called toxicology studies. Um, those tests to see if we're actually, you know, have uh, impacting the you know disease process, at least in our artificial disease processes, um, either again in in kind of laboratory tests or in animal model testing. Those are called pharmacology studies. Um, those are are all done and um, brought then to FDA to support being able to go into clinical trials. And that application to go into the, a clinical trial, the first in human clinical trials called an investigational new drug application or in short referred to as an IND. So when we have the sufficient pharmacology and toxicology information, that of course is all put into the IND submission, but there's a third prong, you know, in addition to understanding how well the drug is likely to work, and it's, um, you know, uh, safety profile. And that's to make sure that when, you know, the drug that humans uh, will, will receive um, is a high enough quality that it will, you know, make sure that, you know, when you get, when a person gets a dose, you know, they're getting a consistent dose. So it's uniform. And we also want to make sure that the manufacturing processes um, are not likely to introduce uh, impurities or, or um, that may be harmful to people. You know, so the third prong is really making sure we have high quality uh, drugs. Um, so we, we care about safety, efficacy, which is the drug benefit, and of course, drug quality. So that drug quality information um, on the processes for manufacturing and the testing of the, the different batches and lots of the drug are also provided in that IND as well as the plans for the, the first clinical trial that's being proposed. Um, the, the study plan is called a clinical protocol, and that as well as investigator information, investigators being the doctors that run the trial, um, are all submitted to FDA for review. If FDA reviews that and agrees that uh, clinical trials uh, may proceed, um, typically the first uh, phase of clinical trials are smaller, shorter studies that are called phase one trials. Um, these trials are, are focused um, on often evaluating first just a single dose and then ultimately uh, multiple doses if it's for a chronic condition um, and also looking often at different uh, doses of, of a drug and identifying you know, the safety profile of that drug in terms of the most common side effects. 
with just a small number of people and only dosing for a short amount of time, uh, we will only be able to see the most common side effects. Um, but those, we want to make sure that at least the common side effect profile um, is a reasonable one and doesn't introduce uh, undue risk uh, for when we take you know, the product into potentially uh, phase two and phase three studies. In addition to looking at drug safety, we can also begin to look at where the drug goes within the body and how long it stays there and how it leaves the body. Um, you know, this kind of uh, pharmacokinetic information and pharmacodynamic information um, helps us make sure that the drug's getting to where it needs to go, to where we think it needs to have an effect. And maybe we can look at some laboratory measures to understand, um, you know, if some of the, the, the effects that we expected, maybe things we saw in those animal models um, are translating to happening in people. We don't usually expect to see um, any drug benefits um, given just how short of dosing we're usually providing in these phase one studies. So this is really just the early precursor kind of tests that show, okay, the drug is, is, is at least having some effect on the disease process or some marker of that. Um, but we're not actually, you know, seeing that translate into improvements in how many patients feel or function uh, or survive. But that allows us from this testing um, to establish that safety profile and then uh, move into what are called phase two clinical trials. Um, these phase two studies are a little longer um, and uh, larger. And this allows us to start to place an emphasis on drugs effectiveness, how well the drug actually works. Um, I didn't mention it, but phase one studies can sometimes be in healthy volunteers, meaning people that act, don't actually have um, the disease or condition that the, the product is intended for. Um, in rare diseases, a lot of the times phase one studies are actually in patients um, to help expedite the, the product's development. Um, but phase two studies are always in um, actual patients living with the condition. And so that allows us, of course, to then, you know, start to look to see if the drug is having an effect. Um, we also, uh, because these studies are a little larger, uh, may be able to introduce a control group or control arm of the study, the most common be being known as a placebo control group, which is essentially the su a sugar pill kind of uh, as the, a way to think of it. Um, where someone's being, you know, uh, given something that looks like the drug product, but um, that way the people who are on drug don't know whether they're on actual drug or placebo and vice versa. Um, so this helps reduce some of the bias in evaluating whether the drug actually works and whether, you know, any improvements are due to the drug versus a placebo effect. Um, you know, in phase two, we may start to, to evaluate that. Um, and you'll notice that this is consistent across all phases of clinical development. We're always looking at how well the, or, or sorry, the drug safety profile. And so by, you know, uh, in these phase two studies, we're getting to see a little bit more duration, longer duration of dosing. Um, so we might be able to see other short-term side effects that pop up um, as dosing is continued. Um, you know, and we do have more people, so we are also able to kind of see, um, you know, and establish rates of those different um, side effects. So if we now have enough um, kind of drug eff effectiveness information um, to do what's called proving uh, proof of concept, we've proven that, you know, we're having, we believe we have the effect um, that's anticipated, it hasn't been fully confirmed, but we're seeing evidence of it. Um, that will help us then inform the design of a phase three clinical trial, which sometimes are referred to, you know, if you've read any press releases or news reports, these are sometimes called the pivotal trials or the registration trials. Um, these phase three studies are, um, you know, the ones that are really intended to establish the drug's benefit because they are the largest and longest usually, um, they also provide us the most safety information. Um, these studies are also uh, usually the most rigorously designed in terms of um, randomization and, and placebo controls, um, you know, to really, again, help establish um, that drug's effectiveness. But because these are larger and longer studies, there's a few other things that, that are added value from them. 
we get to see really now long duration of effect for chronic conditions, you know, studies may be one year or longer. So we not only see how the drug benefits people early on, but we get to see how that looks over time. You know, if it continues to, to improve or if it kind of uh, plateaus and maintains um, over time, because we have many more people in these studies, usually we can begin to see if the drug effect is different in different subpopulations. So, uh, you know, between, you know, diff, uh, based off of sex, age, uh, ethnicity, uh, disease severity, um, you know, see if, if the drug, you know, seems to uh, do a little better or worse uh, in different populations, or maybe even on the safety side has a different safety uh, profile depending on any of those factors. Um, and we may continue even into phase three to still evaluate varying dosages of the drug. Um, at this stage, we would have narrowed those down from our phase one and phase two studies, you know, to the ones that we think are most likely to be both safe and effective. And as I mentioned, we're always looking at safety evaluation. Um, in these phase three studies, we can begin to see, you know, also some of the drug-drug interactions, if there are any from um, commonly used drugs within a particular patient population. So the laws that FDA uh, follows in, in terms of regulating drugs um, allude to the fact that typically uh, more than one of these phase three studies would be needed to support an approval, but it does give FDA um, in certain situations the ability to approve based off of a single positive phase three study. And so that uh, very frequently is what is the case in rare disease settings, um, where only a single phase three study is needed um, with some other um, supporting or confirmatory evidence that's something short of another phase three study. Um, so while, you know, uh, if you're developing drugs for very prevalent conditions, uh, you would expect to have to do multiple phase three studies. Um, in rare disease settings, you know, that, that is, uh, you know, is, is, is much less common, although still does sometimes hap uh, happen. So once we've completed clinical development uh, for a product, we need to go to FDA and meet with FDA to talk about the potential to submit that information in a marketing application. Those marketing applications um, for, for drug products are called new drug applications or NDAs. And for biological products, which are things like vaccines, cell and gene therapy, among other things, other you know, different biologicals, their marketing application is called a biologics license application or BLA. Uh, for all, you know, for most, for, uh, uh, most things, they are essentially the same. Um, so for our discussion today, we can kind of consider those um, the same, but an NDA or BLA is what FDA reviews to determine whether, uh, you know, the drug is safe, effective, and high quality. So we, you know, first meet with FDA in what's called a pre-NDA or a pre-BLA meeting, um, you know, providing them with the top line information from our phase three or other pivotal studies. Um, we talk about how that in, that the results of those studies were analyzed. And the idea here is to say, you know, is this really enough or are there unresolved issues that may require additional testing? Um, if everybody agrees, um, and, uh, the company that's developing the drug can then sub, uh, compile and submit its NDA or BLA to the FDA. And this, this is, application is quite extensive. Um, it doesn't just include the phase three information, but includes all of the information from preclinical um, development, as well as phase one, two, and three uh, clinical trials, as well as all of that manufacturing information um, about the drug's quality, which continues to be gathered as, um, you know, the manufacturing is scaled up, because as you would anticipate, each trial is um, larger and longer than the next. You, you might need to be uh, creating and changing your manufacturing a little bit to be able to make more. And then if you're expecting that you might get approved, you need to make enough to help supply, you know, the entire population of patients that might uh, be prescribed the drug. So once FDA gets that NDA or BLA, um, it looks and determines whether that application is complete. And then if it, and if it uh, confirms that the application is complete, it files it. 
and assigns a review team to evaluate it. In its review, FDA is assessing the effectiveness of the drug, the safety of the drug, and the safety, uh, as you'll hear about uh, in a little bit, is relative to the, the benefits. So the you know, benefits of the drug have to outweigh the risks of the drug. Um, and then uh, the third prong here being, again, the, that manufacturing quality information. So while FDA is reviewing this, they may determine that this is not a, a straightforward uh, decision, that it needs to get input from experts outside of the agency, and it can convene what's called an FDA advisory committee meeting. And so uh, advisory committees are made up of um, experts with different backgrounds. Um, it could be clinical, it could be re uh, different areas of research, biostatistics, um, but these meetings also include a patient expert called a patient representative that serves on the committee and provides expert input to the FDA. Um, the uh, advisory committees will often vote on, you know, what they think in terms of the uh, different aspects of the approvability of the product. Um, but ultimately, anything the advisory committee says or what their votes come out to be are just advisory. FDA still has to take that and make the ultimate decision themselves, and they may uh, ultimately make a different decision than the advisory committee recommended. So even once a drug is approved, uh, the role of, of drug developers and uh, FDA don't stop there. There's continued post-market safety surveillance that happens. Um, you know, during clinical trials, those trials are limited in terms of their inclusion and exclusion criteria. So who can participate? Um, we're usually avoiding, um, you know, really complex cases. So uh, maybe patients that have other comorbidities, you know, are on other types of drugs. Um, but then when the drug gets approved, you know, anyone with the condition may be using it. And so we begin to then gather more information about what the dr drug safety profile looks like in the real world. Um, and we're also now giving it to many more people. So even of the same type that were in trials, just the more people you give it to, the more likely you're to pick up on some of the more rare safety issues that could occur. So those are also collected. And that's you know monitored on an ongoing basis. And FDA uh, has the responsibility of ensuring that the, the benefits continue to outweigh the risks um, even as time goes on. So now that you have that uh, high level overview of how drug development works, let's talk a little bit about FDA's role in that. So we talked about different phases of, of clinical trials and research. Um, that work is done by uh, researchers, pharmaceutical companies, sometimes even nonprofit groups who are either conducting or funding the research um, and drug development studies. It is not FDA that's doing that drug development work. Um, in fact, FDA uh, is not involved in the testing of the drugs in those clinical trials. You know, FDA is not running the trials. Their staff aren't on site for those trials. Um, as we talked about, researchers um, that are conducting the trials have to seek FDA approval, at least for trials in the United States, um, before they can begin. And, and throughout development, um, you know, the drug developers are meeting with FDA to get their input on those study designs, but ultimately those are the, the studies run by, um, you know, and, and conducted by researchers and drug developers. Uh, also, just in terms of uh, once a drug is approved, there's a couple of areas to point out that FDA does not, is not involved in. One is FDA does not have the authority to regulate the practice of medicine. So this means FDA does not have the ability to tell doctors and other prescribers how they should be using approved drugs with their patients. Um, FDA is only regulating the drug companies um, in terms of developing and marketing those products. So doctors are, are free to prescribe FDA approved drugs for other conditions or maybe even patients that are um, the, the drug may be approved for a certain condition, but only certain patients within a population. Um, and a doctor may choose to still use that drug in other parts of that patient population. And this is known as off-label use. Um, so that's outside of FDA's purview. The other is FDA doesn't regulate uh, the price of medicine. So FDA uh, does not consider, is not allowed under the law to consider drug prices as part of its review of new drugs. Um, 
And he, you know, it, even if it had that information, it couldn't rely on it, but it doesn't, you know, FDA does not have that as part of its review. So when it comes to issues of the prices of medicines or whether insurance companies will provide access to medicines, that is outside of FDA's purview. I've mentioned a lot of what FDA doesn't do, but I want to mention just to, you know, uh, I don't want to, uh, to de-emphasize the important role that FDA plays. They do have a mission to help promote the public health, not just protect it. And the FDA reviewers, you know, they're seeing every research program for every drug. Um, so whether it's, you know, uh, trials of other drugs in the same condition, or maybe other just related conditions and other general kind of lessons learned, you know, they have a lot of uh, understanding of what works and what doesn't work. And so they're providing technical help to researchers and drug developers all through those different stages of development. There's many meetings and different submissions for technical feedback that uh, researchers and drug developers interact with FDA, and that's to help tap into that knowledge that they provide. That way, help FDA can help companies design trials with the greatest chances of success of actually, you know, uh, being able to conclude whether or not the drug is safe or effective. And again, this is done through lots of different consultations throughout the development process. So I've covered at a very high level and, and pretty rapidly, um, you know, how uh, drug products are developed and how FDA regulates those. Um, FDA has some good resources on this uh, type of information on their uh, For Patients website listed here. Um, so I encourage you, if you are interested in learning more about this, um, this is uh, one place where you can do so. So at this point, we wanna actually uh, now talk about where your voices as patients and caregivers fit into that process of drug development and review. And so I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Larry Bauer, um, to talk to us about patient-focused drug development. Okay, thank you so much, James, uh, for the great overview of the FDA's role. Um, and now we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about this meeting. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Deborah talked a little bit about this earlier. You know, what's the purpose of this meeting that we're planning? You know, the FDA wanted to have a more systematic way to gather patient perspectives about different conditions and, and different available treatment options, because this information really helps to inform their understanding of the context of the benefits and the risks of um, when they're making decisions about approving new drugs. And patient input helps the FDA during drug development and during their review of the application for a, a new drug. Uh, next slide. So I, I mentioned just a minute ago, benefit risk assessment. So when the FDA gets a, a new drug application, so a company submits all the research data they've collected on a new drug, the FDA has to make the important decision, do we approve this drug or not? One of the ways they do this is that they evaluate what are the benefits from this new drug versus what are the risks of the new drug. And to help them understand this, they have to first analyze the condition. So what is the disease? You know, what are the symptoms? How do those symptoms impact people's lives? They need to understand what are the current treatment options? So for instance, if it's a new drug for high blood pressure, there's many other drugs on the market already for high blood pressure. So they can look at other data, they can compare it to that. But for some rare diseases, there's no approved treatment and that changes the way they uh, look at a new drug. Um, and when it comes to the benefits and the risks, this is where they look at the research data that's been collected on a new um, drug from clinical trials. Um, they analyze the data, they do a statistical analysis, but it's these first two things, the analysis of the condition and the current treatment options that our meeting that we're planning for HPP is going to help the FDA. Uh, next slide. So this uh, patient-focused drug development meeting, it's a framework. You know, we have a framework of discussion questions. We have modeled our meeting on the, the meetings that the FDA had designed um, originally to do this uh, patient-focused drug development process. Um, we reviewed uh, 
all different kinds of questions and we tailored our panel and agenda questions to try to communicate to the FDA the most important information that we think that they're gonna to need to know about HPP. And the Food and Drug Administration has emphasized that active patient involvement and participation is the key to the success of these meetings. So that's why we're having this webinar today to try to get you excited and enthusiastic to uh, get involved. Uh, next slide. Uh, people ask, what's the outcome of the meeting? So at the end of the day, we will have you know listened and learned from everyone and we will hire a medical writer that's gonna write up everything we heard during the day and put it into a report called the Voice of the Patient Report. Um, it's a summary of basically everything we've heard. So with people that are um, panelists, people that are calling in, people that are providing written comments, we're gonna you know, use all of those sources. And this document becomes a, an important communication document for the FDA review staff and if when they get a new drug for HPP that comes to them to review, they will go back to the voice of the patient report to try to remember, well, what was it that the patient said? And um, FDA really wants this information and has told us again and again that it helps to inform them uh, about meaningful treatments for HPP. Uh, next slide. So how can you participate in the meeting? Um, okay, who is it for? Deborah mentioned this a little bit. It's an open public meeting. So it's for you all patients, caregivers, for the FDA staff, for clinicians, um, pharma companies, biotech companies, and anyone interested in learning. You can invite family, friends, your doctors, anyone. It'll take place virtually on November 15th of this year from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern time. And it's an uh, interactive live stream. And there will be a link that you can go to on the SoftBones webpage on the day of the meeting where you can click and get access to um, join the meeting. Uh, next slide. So just to go over what, you know, what's the meeting gonna look like? We'll start out in the morning with the welcome. We'll have some introductory comments from a representative from SoftBones as well as a representative from the FDA. Then we're going to have an HPP expert, a doctor, give us a clinical background on HPP so that everyone has a basic understanding of HPP. And then the rest of the day will be divided into two topics. In the morning, we're going to focus on how HPP symptoms affect your life. So what symptoms do you have? How do those symptoms affect your, you know, your daily living? And then we'll have a break for lunch for a half hour and we'll come back in the afternoon and shift gears into talking about treatments. So what is it you currently do to manage HPP? How do you manage the symptoms? And what are your thoughts about future treatments? So if there was going to be a new treatment for HPP, what would you like to see? What symptom would you like to see uh, treated that um, most impacts your life? The way that we're going to do this, we're going to have pre-recorded patient panels. There'll be five for the morning and five for the uh, afternoon. These were people that were pre-selected and will pre-record their statements in advance of the meetings. And then after we hear from the pre-recorded panelists, we're going to have a moderated discussion. Um, James, who, my colleague who you heard earlier, will be the moderator for the meeting, and he'll be asking you questions um, that, that, that will lead to a discussion. And then at the end of the day, we'll have a summary of the entire day and some closing comments. Um, next slide. So what are some of the questions we might ask in the morning session? Um, some of the questions might be like, of all the symptoms of HPP, what one to three symptoms have the most significant impact on your life? How does HPP affect you on your best days and your worst days? And can you describe those days to us? And are there specific activities that are important to you that you can't do at all or is fully because of HPP? Next slide. Um, another question is, how have your symptoms changed over time? So what was it like when you were first diagnosed with HPP and where are you at today? And we also want to know about, you know, how are you coping? So how have you coped with the, the symptoms of HPP as they've changed over time? And then another question is, what do you fear the most as you get older? So what worries you about having HPP? 
and what frustrates you about this. Um, next slide. Um, then in the afternoon, these are uh, some examples of some of the types of questions we might ask. So what are you currently doing to manage your HPP symptoms? We want to know both medication type things that you might be doing, but other things like some people might be using things like acupuncture or supplements. We want to hear about everything that you're doing. And how well do these treatments treat the most significant symptoms of your HPP? And then we'd also, we want to hear about the benefits that you're getting from the treatments you're using, but we also want to hear about the downside. So what are the most significant downsides to your current treatment and how do those downsides affect your life? And then finally, of course, we know everybody would like to see a cure for HPP, but short of a complete cure, what specific things would you look for in an ideal treatment for HPP? Um, next slide. Uh, another question, there might be a couple questions about research participation. So what would motivate you to participate in a clinical trial? Um, this is the discussion format. As I mentioned, there will be a panel of patients for each topic. The purpose of these panels is to set the foundation for the broader audience discussion that will follow. The panelists were selected to reflect a range of experiences with HPP. Um, we're also going to use uh, live polling. Um, this will, will ask everybody in the audience that's either a patient or a caregiver to use, you know, get your cell phone out. We'll give you instructions how to log on to poll everywhere, and there'll be live polling questions. Once again, these are going to help us with the discussion to follow. And then after we do, you know, a couple polling questions, we're going to have a live discussion with the audience. There'll be a telephone number at the top of your screen. James will ask a question, and then we're going to ask you all to please call in, and James will take calls one at a time and discuss with you. Um, we also, there's a way for people, if you're shy or if you want to send in a comment in advance of the meeting, you can send in written comments. But we do want to have as many people calling in as possible on the day of the meeting. FDA said they really like to hear live voices um, you know, from actual people. Um, next slide. So these are just a couple of tips for how you can participate in the meeting effectively. Please remember the FDA's role and the purpose of our meeting. So the purpose is to educate the FDA. Think back to what James mentioned earlier about what FDA's role is and what it isn't. Maybe review the discussion questions that, that I just showed in advance of the meeting. And if you have something important you'd like to share, try to relate it to the most appropriate topic or panel question, and then pick up your phone and please call in. And know that it's okay to reiterate a feeling or an experience already voiced by someone else, even if it's similar to your own, but when you call in, give it your own kind of personal or unique perspective. We also ask that you try to keep your comments concise and focused. You know, there are many voices to be heard about this highly emotional topic. So we'd like everybody to try to really think about what the question is that James is asking and to try to re relate your call into um, that specific topic. And then at the end of the day, if there was something that you didn't get to, you can always send in additional comments after the meeting in writing. Um, next slide. So, you know, to participate in the discussion and participate in the meeting, it's going to be webcast so people can watch from all over the country and even all over the world. Um, you're going to be, you know, everybody will be remote uh, and we hope that you participate in the polling questions and then calling in and writing in. Um, to pre-register for the meeting, the link will be coming soon. You know, stay tuned to the Softbones website and more information will be forthcoming. Um, and like I said, comments with answers to questions can be submitted now, so in advance of the meeting or up to 30 days after the meeting. And we will try to incorporate as many of these comments as possible into the voice of the patient report, which will be event, you know, submitted to the FDA. Um, next slide. So in summary, this meeting is your opportunity to be part of the process. You can have a meaningful impact on clinical trial design and drug development for new products for HPP.
your collective voices, they must be heard at the beginning of the process to really help uh, drug companies design better clinical trials that meet your needs and to help the FDA assess the risks and benefits with a full understanding of what the impact might be on HPP and what is the patient and caregiver perspective. So please join us and be part of the process and help make a difference. Uh, next slide. So we have about, I think about 10 minutes left. Um, if you have a question, I'd like to ask you to please post the question in the chat. I'm gonna ask for um, James to come back and Deborah Fowler and Denise Goodman. Um, we're all gonna be here to answer anything, anything whatsoever about the meeting, how to participate, the outcomes, and we'll, we'll take turns answering for you. Um, okay, so the first question I see is, should we be inviting our doctors to participate? Um, James, do you wanna weigh in on that? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. And, and the, you know, the answer to that is uh, sure, definitely. You know, we, uh, while our primary audience um, is really to inform the FDA and also drug developers, the, the people that are doing the um, you know, research and development of new drugs to ensure that trials align with what's important to you. And ultimately that FDA considers that when they're making those benefit risk decisions, this information that you'll be sharing and, and teaching us about what it is to live with HPP and, um, you know, what, you know, your unmet medical needs are given what treatments you have available can really, you know, be valuable for many different stakeholders. And definitely, um, Larry and I have heard time and time again, not just any doctors, but even the top, you know, uh, what are called, you know, key opinion leaders or KOLs in the field come, at, you know, say to us after these meetings that they learned a lot, that they couldn't believe it. You know, they're supposed to be the world's experts and yet they learn something new. Um, we've also seen the heads of patient organizations um, who know their community, but just never have had this type of forum before say the same thing. And so um, even if you have a really good doctor that you think is in tune with your condition as much as, as they can be, or you know, or maybe some someone that is still learning um, about your condition. Either way, I think they're going to get value out of attending. So I would encourage you to to invite them. Yeah, because when you think about it, when you go to a doctor's visit, they're asking you, you know, basically really quickly, how do you feel? Do you have enough medication? Anything new? That kind of stuff. But but they never get into some of the nitty gritty of what we're going to be talking about during this meeting. So that's you know why sometimes they learn from hearing from you all. Yeah, I see some other questions in the chat. Um, one of them, you know, people are asking about if they have experiences before and after treatment and they want to weigh in on those. Um, do you prefer one or the other? And I guess the answer is there's really an opportunity to weigh in on both of those because one of the way the agenda is built, part of the discussion is around symptoms and what it's like without treatment. And then part of the discussion is around treatments, um, FDA treatments and other, you know, including <clears throat> as Larry had mentioned, acupuncture, or other modalities that are, that are tried by patients. So I think it, there's really different times to weigh in on each, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then another question came in, <clears throat> sorry, about how um, to invite other people to attend, whether it's physicians, patients, family members. We uh, will be creating a website page for registration that will be uh, a page specifically dedicated to our externally led PFDD that we will be sharing on all of our sites um, with plenty of time before the meeting on November 15th. So you can share that with your family members. You can share that. There'll be a flyer that we can create from there that you can share email. Um, it'll be available through many different forms that you can share with your extended family and your, um, your care team. Deborah, if I can maybe just piggyback on the first sure. question about yep. pre and post treatment. Mm -hmm. So uh, Larry described how the meeting's organized and in the morning, we're really going to want to hear and understand you know, the symptoms and health effects that you experience, what those have looked like over time. 
And by and large, we're kind of looking to, to understand that not in terms of treat, you know, your treatments and treatment successes. So, you know, or, uh, or maybe even treatment challenges, you know, so perhaps that is going to be more of the focus of the morning. In the afternoon, we definitely want to hear about the treatments you've tried, um, how you, what made, you know, led you to make the treatment decisions that you have made, you know, so where were you at with your disease experience? You know, what were the factors that were important to you in terms of deciding whether or not to um, embark on a certain treatment regimen? Uh, and then, you know, what did you experience as a result of that? And that would be anything from, you know, the first things you noticed, um, you know, perhaps if, uh, whether that's good things, benefits, or even downsides like side effects, um, as well as, you know, what that's looked like over time. So we'll have plenty of time to talk about both. Um, and in fact, it's almost like our, our meeting is structured um, to provide you those opportunities to talk about, um, you know, that treatment experience separate from, you know, the, the overall disease experience. Yeah, there was another uh, comment that came in through the chat that I think is an important one. And that's, you know, there's a lot about HPP and current treatments that we don't know. Um, for example, there's a lot of questions around dosing. Um, you know, when, when people are on drug, the levels of their enzyme are very, very high in their bodies. Is that okay? Is that good long-term? Um, and obviously we're educating the FDA on, on this, so they're not going to know the answer to that. But what about sharing some of those concerns around what, what keeps you up at night and things that are concerning as, as patients? Is, is that appropriate for us to share, James and Larry? And, and where do you kind of see that part coming up in the conversation? So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start on this. So we, we have to remember this is an opportunity for you to really be transparent and bring out everything about your experience. Sometimes, you know, sometimes when you, you know, HPP is pretty much a chronic illness and there's certain parts of it that you've gotten so used to because you've had it for years, perhaps, that you don't ever talk about or you don't think about. But this meeting is a time where sometimes we call, you know, we speak about like pulling back the curtain. We want to hear about some of those things. Some, you know, your lives have been impacted. We want to know what that's like. And as far as, um, not understanding certain things about your treatment or, you know, like some of the things that, De that De Deb just talked about, that's all fair game. If it's part of your personal experience, then it can be discussed at the meeting. What we, we don't want you to, to do is to speak on behalf of the community. Like we don't want you to say, oh, people with HPP have experienced such and such. We want to hear your stories. You know, I want to hear Suzanne's story. I want to hear Kirsten's story. I want to hear Mary's story. I want to hear from all these different people. And that's what the FDA wants to hear because hearing each of your personal stories is going to paint the picture of HPP from many different sides. So. Great. I don't see any other questions in the chat. So, um... Hopefully we've been pretty comprehensive and obviously there'll be other chances for people to send us questions as we lead up to the actual meeting. All right, so with that, I, and we're gonna conclude the webinar and I'll uh, stop the recording. And again, this will be available on the website for anybody that you wanna share this with um, or anybody who couldn't make the webinar today to learn more about how to engage in our externally led patient-focused drug development meeting. Um, so thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to your engagement over the next couple of weeks leading up to our meeting. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Care. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye.